Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm going to take my mask off. Um, I'm Dr. Bailey. I'm the newest member of the Movement Disorders team at Novant. Um, I joined in August, so uh, I'm really happy to be a part of the group. I'm happy to be here in Wilmington. So today we're just going to give a brief introduction to Parkinson's disease. Come on in. Come on in and have a seat. Okay. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the basics of Parkinson's disease, what it is, how it's diagnosed, what the pathology looks like, and then the treatment that we have. So these are the topics that we're going to talk a little bit about today. We're going to talk about what Parkinson's disease actually is, how we diagnose it, what are the causes of Parkinson's disease, as well as some of the risk factors, who gets Parkinson's disease, and then some of the like a very brief history of Parkinson's disease knowledge. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about um, how we treat Parkinson's disease, some questions about levodopa, and then the range of available treatments that we have. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, making the most out of your clinic visit. So first off, what is Parkinson's disease? So the clinical description of Parkinson's disease was um, written in a small essay by James Parkinson in 1817. So he described these patients who had a shaking palsy. You can see here the, the, um, the description of the gait and the posture. Uh, and then in the 1870s to 1890s, uh, Dr. Charcot, who's a very famous neurologist and his students publicized the Parkinson's disease essay um, so that people would have more knowledge about Parkinson's disease. So we've known about Parkinson's for quite a long time. So the core symptoms of Parkinson's disease are bradykinesia, which is slowness of movement or slow halting movement and rest tremor and rigidity or a specific type of stiffness. So when you diagnose a patient with Parkinson's disease, they have to have bradykinesia. So a patient with just tremor does not meet the qualifications for Parkinson's disease. They have to have this very specific slowness of movement and then at least one of tremor or rigidity. So if you don't have a rest tremor, you can still have Parkinson's disease by meeting the other two criteria of rigidity and bradykinesia, which is sometimes a misconception in um, like general knowledge about Parkinson's disease is that you have to have a resting tremor to have Parkinson's and that is not true. So there are other types of Parkinsonisms. So this is sometimes something that people would get confused about is what's the difference between Parkinson's disease and a Parkinsonism. Parkinsonism can look like Parkinson's disease, but it either doesn't meet all the features of Parkinson's disease, or there are other features on top of it that also, um, that will give it another diagnosis. And these, these are things like drug-induced Parkinsonism, so patients on a drug that makes them look like they have Parkinson's disease. Um, sometimes advanced Alzheimer's disease looks like Parkinson's disease. And then these other diseases that we will look for when we're trying to diagnose a patient with Parkinson's disease, like multiple system atrophy, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy and corticobasal degeneration, which are more advanced diseases that are very rare, but we always look for these diseases to make sure that we're not misdiagnosing a patient. So Parkinson's disease is not just motor symptoms, it's motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms. So when we diagnose, we're just looking for the motor symptoms initially. So we're looking for tremor, slowness, and stiffness. And then as the disease progresses, we may have postural instability, which means problems with balance. But then as the disease, as we're all also talking about the disease and other things that we have to look for and treat during these patient visits are mood, fatigue, um, smell, taste, that also can decline in Parkinson's disease. That's often an early symptom, um, as well as bowel, bladder, sexual dysfunction, and sleep. So we kind of try to hit all of these targets when we're talking to patients who come into clinic. So this is a complicated disease. So every person with Parkinson's disease is different, and I cannot stress this enough. So you can see here, this was a, a really great a diagram from a recently published paper talking about how, you know, when we used to talk about patients with Parkinson's, this was the type of picture that we always used, but this is also a patient with Parkinson's disease, a younger patient who has this uh, complication of Parkinson's called dystonia, where the foot will turn in, or just a regular looking person who's on medication, and when they're on, they look normal, when they're off, then they kind of have some of the cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So, when you go to a support group or you come to the clinic, it's really important to re recognize this, that every person is different. 
And if every person was the same, then I wouldn't have a job because it would be easy to treat, but this is a complicated disease, right? So we, we always have to remember this and you should remember it too. So some of the motor symptoms that we've already talked about are tremor, uh, typically starting on one side, um, the rigidity or stiffness, bradykinesia, which is a specific type of slowness, um, stooped posture is very prevalent um, where patients can be a little bit bent over. Um, no, 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 you're fine. It's perfectly fine. Um, decreased facial expression. This is something that people don't recognize as being a part of Parkinson's disease and can often be confused with depression or apathy. But in reality, you're just not able to move your facial muscles as much. And so you have a blank expression on your face. So spouses or children or friends may say, are you mad at me? Is there something wrong? But in reality, your facial muscles are also slow. So you're not able to make as much of an expression. So Michael J. Fox is a famous actor with this disease, and he's actually had to train himself to move his face as well when he's acting because it's not a natural thing any longer. So this is something that also declines. Um, patients will also complain of soft voice. This is also because of the muscles. Everything, most things in your body that are voluntary are muscle. So your vocal cords are also a muscle and these can be discoordinated or in coordinated Parkinson's disease. So you'll have a softer voice as well. Um, smaller handwriting, that's often one of the first symptoms that patients will complain about. Swallowing difficulty is something that we typically notice further on in the disease, but it's similar to the coordination of the muscles in the throat. So those can be discoordinated as well. And then you can have swallowing issues and then dystonia which is um, actually very common, but can be difficult to recognize in patients. So foot turning in is very common. Um, sometimes we'll get upper extremity or arm dystonia, but it's basically contractures of muscles um, to form this abnormal posture. Uh, so that woman with the, the running where her foot was turning in, that's pretty common. So non-motor symptoms that are really, really common. Can't think of the right word. <laughs> That's really common in Parkinson's disease. And it doesn't mean that you're developing dementia. It's just something that we call bradyphrenia, which is also something called slowness of thought. So things take a little bit longer and that's because the brain has changed, right? Dopamine is really important for quick thinking. And so when you don't have enough dopamine in your brain, the thoughts come more slowly. So it's kind of the, the same thing that's going on in your body where it takes longer to move the thoughts also come slower, but this is not a sign of dementia or a sign of cognitive decline. It's very common early in the disease. Even patients who I first see for their first appointment will complain about this. Um, hallucinations, that's something that people are always worried about, especially because the new Plaza commercials with the man who's like locked in his house. I really hate that commercial because um, it's not true, um, but this can be a symptom that occurs late in the disease process. Um, and oftentimes they're not really bothersome to the patient. So people will see things like a cat or a loved one, but it's not like schizophrenia where you're afraid or you're paranoid. Most of the time that doesn't happen. Um, loss of motivation is really, really common. That's another thing that happens because of the loss of dopamine. Dopamine is really important for motivational behavior. Uh, and then loss of smell and taste um, and depression and anxiety, I apologize. So, Similar to dopamine levels being low, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Serotonin and norepinephrine are also low in Parkinson's disease. So these are chemicals in your brain that are very important for mood and they're low in all Parkinson's patients. So some of the, some patients who have a predilection for depression, whose levels might have been lower before the diagnosis, you might experience more depression and anxiety. And I've even had patients who've had you know, depression, anxiety, severe for two years before they had the diagnosis or e even any symptoms of Parkinson's disease, because that can present first. So that's very, very common. And we have ways to treat that. So if you are feeling this way, please let us know. And we can definitely help you with those feelings. Okay. Loss of smell and taste. This is because the olfactory nerve is damaged in Parkinson's disease. And that can happen very, very early. So patients will complain of loss of smell, years before they have a tremor, any slowness. And this is something that we don't really have great treatments for other than just, you know, change your eating habits, maybe add some spicy foods to your diet. Um, sleep problems, again, very common. 
Um, patients will often have talking in their sleep or acting out their dreams. Patients may not know about this, but their care providers will. So your spouse is in the bed getting kicked. They will know that this is happening. Uh, so we'll often ask about this. Constipation, very common. Um, all of us know how to treat constipation. So if you're having this problem, don't be embarrassed. Please ask us. Uh, urinary problems, similar. And then sexual dysfunction, that's also very common. It can be very embarrassing to talk about, but if this is something that you wanna address, please let us know. And then pain. So pain comes from joint dysmobility. So patients often will have joint pain, neck pain, because the stiffness makes those joints really tight. And so it can be very uncomfortable. Any questions so far? No? Okay. So who gets Parkinson's disease? So this is um, some information from the Parkinson's Foundation. It's the Parkinson's Prevalence Project. So there are about a million people in the United States with Parkinson's disease right now, about 2 million in Europe and the United States. So it's a fairly common disease, um, but you can see there's a little bit of a difference um, in patient populations depending on state. So we think this may be due to environmental triggers. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So when we talk about risk factors for any disease process, we always have to remember that association does not equal causation. So even if you're exposed to something, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the cause. So this was a funny study that was done um, <laughs> that looked at ice cream sold in the summer and murders. And if you just believe that information, then you'll believe people who buy ice cream are going to commit murders. But that's, that's really not the case, right? So even though there might be, it look like there's an association, this is not the cause. So we always have to be really careful about studies that are um, published about causes of Parkinson's disease, because we've got to look more carefully at that data. Um, is, are they, is there a true link or is this just an association that doesn't really make sense? So the most common risk factor is age. So the older you are, the more likely you are to get Parkinson's disease. So um, also men are more likely to get Parkinson's disease. Uh, for whatever reason, we're not entirely sure what this is yet, but women are a slightly lower risk um, of developing Parkinson's disease than men. So everyone always asks this question, is Parkinson's disease genetic? Is my family gonna get it? Am I gonna pass it on to my children? 90% of Parkinson's disease is not genetic. It's idiopathic, what we call, where we don't know what the underlying cause is. Only 10% of Parkinson's disease cases result from a genetic mutation. And some of these genes are directly causing Parkinson's disease, and some of them just cause an increased risk. So I never really test patients for Parkinson's unless they're very young, these genes, because if your family has it, some of, a lot of these genes are not causative, they increase your risk. So it's not worth worrying about whether or not you're gonna get Parkinson's disease if you just have a gene that might increase the risk of your, of your developing this disease. So that's why we don't routinely test for this because it's not, most times it's not the cause. So environmental factors are something that is being studied heavily right now. So a lot of you have seen the ads on TV about paraquat exposure, there's a lot of different environmental exposures. Manganese used to be a major cause of Parkinson's uh, and they've removed that from, uh, like welders used to get it because they were exposed to high levels of manganese. They removed that so that these patients don't have that any, or these people don't get that exposure anymore. Um, pesticides, herbicides, these things, there's a heavy link between those two things. Um, heavy metal solvents, air pollution, um, polychlorinated biphenyls, these are chemicals that all have been shown to increase risk in general population. So when we look at the numbers of Parkinson's disease, age, if it was just due to age, it would be a number that we could easily predict. But these numbers are much higher than we're seeing now. And we think that the reason why this is happening is because of toxic exposures that have occurred over people's lifetimes. So traumatic brain injury is also a risk factor. But like everything else, not everyone who has a traumatic brain injury develops Parkinson's disease. So what is the link between the two? We don't know that yet. So purely biological, genetic, or environmental Parkinson's is very rare. So just being exposed to something doesn't mean you're gonna get Parkinson's disease. Um, like I said, gen genetics is, are very rare. So most cases are caused by a combination of a genetic and a biological predisposition to an environmental trigger. 
So it's almost like you have a loaded gun with your jeans and then something has to pull the trigger. So that's probably an environmental exposure at some point in your life. So not everyone with these genetic predispositions is gonna develop Parkinson's disease, but because of some exposure that has occurred, and it, we don't really know, it could occur in your 20s, it could occur in your 40s, we're not entirely sure when this would be, but because of that trigger, then you're gonna develop Parkinson's disease. What about decreased risk? So there's been a lot of research on this um, because we're trying to look at things that might decrease the risk or decrease the rate of um, Parkinson's disease once you get the disease. So we've looked at uh, higher urate levels. So people with gout, this is mostly in men. Men with gout have a lower risk of Parkinson's disease. So they did a study where they tried to increase urate levels, which caused a lot of Parkinson's patients to get gout, um, but it didn't do anything. So <laughs> that was really unfortunate. Um, cigarette smokers are less likely to get Parkinson's disease by a significant amount, uh, but we don't tell people to smoke because the risk of smoking is much, much worse, uh, I think, than getting Parkinson's disease. Um, male coffee drinkers, for some reason, uh, are less likely to get Parkinson's disease. People who have a higher level of physical activity, um, people who take higher levels of non steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, um, Aleve, those types of medications are less likely. And then there are genes that can lower the risk of development. Um, we're not entirely sure all of these genes, but there are definitely some genes uh, that lower the risk. So what have we done to study this? You know, obviously we don't tell people to smoke, but we've given people nicotine to see if that would slow down the progression of Parkinson's disease. We've given people caffeine. But it seems like once you develop Parkinson's disease, there's, we can't really turn back the clock with these risk factors. The only thing that we think might slow down the progression is physical activity. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later. So what is causing Parkinson's disease? So this is a part of the brain called the midbrain, okay? If you look at the whole thing cut this way, it kind of looks like an upside down Mickey Mouse with the ears being over here. So in healthy patients, you have this area called the substantia nigra, which means black substance. That's a byproduct of the production of dopamine. So when your brain makes dopamine, it makes melanin, which is black. Um, melanin is the same substance that produces the color in your skin. So it's colored. So you can see this just as a byproduct. But in Parkinson's disease patients, those cells that make dopamine die. And so you can no longer, you no longer get this black substance because there's no dopamine production. So there's no longer any melanin production. So that's what causes the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease and some of the cognitive stuff like the problems with slowness of thinking. So just a little bit about um, dopamine in general and some of the scientists that discovered um, dopamine. So like I said, Parkinson's disease the essay on shaking palsy was written in 1817, but it wasn't until the 1960s that we even knew that dopamine, that was the link between Parkinson's disease and dopamine. And these two scientists, um, Arvid Carlson, and um, I don't know how to say his name, um, Ole Hornikwitz, maybe, um, he, these were the two scientists that really looked at um, levodope or dopamine causing Parkinson's disease by looking at animal models of Parkinsonism, as well as looking at brains of patients who had Parkinson's disease to um, recognize that there was no dopamine left in these patients' brains. So what happens to cause this? So alpha-synuclein is a chemical or is a protein that's in every cell in your body. It's all over your body. But in Parkinson's disease patients, for some reason, this um, alpha-synuclein protein malforms and it becomes sticky and it starts to stick to each other. And these clusters where they stick to each other are called Lewy bodies. And this is, oh, sorry. This is a Lewy body inside of the cell, this. So as the disease progresses, we, we think that Parkinson's disease starts outside of the brain. So this is the olfactory nerve where the smell, you, you, your sense of smell is, and then this is your brain stem. So these Lewy bodies actually progress up through the brain. And as the disease progresses, you get more and more of them until you get them all throughout the brain. So that's why you have these motor symptoms first, because the midbrain is right here where that substantia nigra is. And then you start to get non-motor things like problems with thinking and memory as the disease progresses. So 
Um, the scientist who discovered this was Dr. Louie. He described these inclusion bodies in 1912, but uh, 1997 was the first time that we saw that alpha-synuclein protein is shown in Louie bodies. So uh, this is a long time, a lot of research that's been done. So what we have found is that dopamine production goes down. So here is the substantia nigra, right? So you progress from normal dopamine production and then it starts about 10 years from diagnosis is when the dopamine loss starts to occur. So the dopamine loss progresses, progresses, progresses until you no longer make dopamine. And the same thing with the alpha-synuclein. So we know that alpha-synuclein starts to aggregate or clump up about 20 years before the motor symptoms start. So this is a disease that is really, really early. It starts much earlier than we think. And then as the alpha-synuclein increases, and spreads throughout the brain, then you have worsening symptoms. Okay. Any questions so far? Uh huh. Does that mean that um, you talk about risk factors like environmental issues? So yes. If you're 20 years prior to symptoms, you your brain starts decreasing dopamine a little bit. Yes. Is, is, can you really cause the link to environmental issues to the Yes, and that's what we're trying to figure out right now, right? What are, when does this happen? When does this start happening? Um, we have found in patients who had um, colonoscopies with biopsies that there's alpha-synuclein in the gut decades before there's alpha-synuclein in the brain. So we think that it starts actually in the gut and then it spreads up through the gut into the brain over time. So that's why it takes 20 years and that's why some patients will have constipation for decades before the onset of Parkinson's disease because the gut is affected with the Parkinson's before the brain is affected. Any other questions? No? Okay, so symptoms do worsen over time as the dopamine neurons decline. Um, and as the disease progresses, we start to have non-motor symptoms as well because the alpha-synuclein involves more parts of the brain. So this is a question I get asked a lot is what stage of Parkinson's disease am I? Where am I gonna go? So there are five stages of Parkinson's disease. Stage one is where there's symptoms on one side, uh, very little change, treatment is often not necessary. And then stage two, um, most patients come in to see me, they're at this stage where symptoms are on both sides, not always necessarily problematic and treatment may need to begin at this stage, but some patients don't need treatment right, right at this stage. Stage three is actually where patients stay, right? Patients don't often move to stage four and stage five. Stage three means that you have balance problems. Um, so this can mean just losing your balance occasionally. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're falling or that you're needing a wheelchair, but your balance is slightly affected. So you have a fall risk, but you're still very independent. And so we just adjust the treatments at that point in time to try to help with balance, try to help with um, the motor symptoms that you're having and maybe some of the non-motor symptoms. Stage four is you're still able to walk or stand without help, but you need a walker or you may need a wheelchair. Um, and this is also, we just adjust medications at that stage. And then stage five is bed bound. Um, but this is the stage where most people stay. So still independent, still able to walk, may need a walker. You know, at some points you may need a wheelchair if you're going out in public at an airport, but most people stay at stage three. When we talk about stages, it's really mostly so that we can describe patients to one another as clinicians or as researchers. So we can say this patient's stage three, this patient's stage four, but this is not like cancer right, where you're continually progressing unless you get treatment and then you're gonna pass away because it's just spreading everywhere. This is not how Parkinson's disease progresses. And like I said, every patient is different. So while some people may end up at stage five, most people stay at stage three, okay? Mm -hmm. When you say stay at stage three, you're, are you saying they, they just kind of stay there until they die of some other disease? Yes, or? yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. There was a study done recently looking at life expectancy of Parkinson's patients, and it wasn't significantly changed. The life expectancy was a little bit lower in patients with Parkinson's disease, but not significantly where we can say for sure everyone's going to die with Parkinson's disease. So most people don't die from Parkinson's disease. They die with Parkinson's disease. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
newly bodied. Um, when is it newly bodied dementia? So that's a good question. Lewy body dementia is a completely different disease. And I'll go back just to this slide. So Lewy body dementia is when this happens all at once. So alpha synuclein doesn't start in the brainstem and spread up. Lewy body dementia is where you get alpha synuclein inclusion. Lewy body is everywhere in the brain. And so when that happens, you get dementia and Parkinson's at the same time. So that's a, that's a totally different disease. It's caused by the same chemical, but it's a different disease altogether. Okay, so when we get Parkinson's disease and dementia, we call it Parkinson's disease dementia because it's not Lewy body dementia because that's a totally different disease. My, my brother died mm -hmm. at, this, at this point here, so Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. but, and I, I wasn't near when he got, when I wasn't near after he died. Yeah. They, they did some tests and they declared that it was Lewy body dementia. Mm -hmm. So he probably had Lewy bodies throughout the brain, um, but at the end stages of Parkinson's in pathology are very difficult to differentiate between Lewy body disease and Parkinson's disease. So it's really the clinical picture that we see. And one more brief thing. So I have been on positional vertigo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that that would that complicate determining whether I'm stage three? No. Because it doesn't cause me to fall. Yes. That's not that's a totally different disease. So we wouldn't we would not test you. Yeah, we wouldn't say you're stage four because you're falling because you have vertigo. We would never, right? That's cruel if we were to test your postural stability while you have vertigo. So we would just wait until that's over and then we'd assess your Parkinson's disease. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions before we move on? No? Okay. So how is my Parkinson's disease going to go? So these are some prodromal symptoms that we talked about. So acting out dreams, that's really common. Patients who act out their dreams have a really high risk of developing Parkinson's disease in the future. Um, loss of sense of smell, these things happen before. Uh, constipation, trouble with urination, um, and anxiety, depression. So these are really common that occur before the motor symptoms. So these are what we call the, uh, the prodromal symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So then we have um, the early symptoms of Parkinsonism, which is when patients get diagnosed, so they develop bradykinesia and rigidity, um, and probably about 60% of patients have tremor, but 40% don't. Um, this is no to mild disability response while the medications and very independent. So people work, um, young patients have children. Um, this is uh, probably the stage where most patients stay for the longest. And then what are some general truths about Parkinson's disease? So Parkinson's disease is mild for a very long time. Okay, this, this disease, and it's very slowly progressive. And the symptoms that we have are very treatable. So tell your doctor what's going on and we can help with whatever symptoms that you're having. The course varies with every person, right? So some people will progress more quickly. Some people will progress more slowly. Um, but typically this is a decades long disease. So this is not something that we measure in even months or even a few years. This is five to 10 years that we're measuring these symptoms progress. Uh, trauma predominant Parkinson's disease for some reason tends to progress more slowly. Um, and dementia early in the disease is a, associated with a, an aggressive course in shorter life expectancy. So when we talk about this trauma predominant disease and uh, early dementia, what we're thinking more about in Parkinson's disease now is that these are not the same disease. They look similar, but they may not be exactly the same disease. And that's why so many patients with Parkinson's look so completely different from each other. So in future clinical trials, what you may see is that patients are separated into these groups, right? Tremor predominant patients, non-tremor predominant patients. And that, that, that way we can get a better idea what exactly is happening with these subgroups of patients. Because if we lump everyone together, a lot of these medications won't work. But if we separate people, maybe we can find treatments for different disease presentations. Any questions? Okay, so how do we treat Parkinson's disease? So like I said, levodopa treatment was developed in the 1960s once it was developed, okay? Uh, these are some of the scientists. Um, 
that recognized uh, or that were able to develop levodopa as a treatment um, and recognized that levodopa was the, um, the neuron or neurotransmitter that was involved in Parkinson's disease. So um, there was a remarkable response um, of Parkinson's disease to levodopa. This is still the gold standard of treatment that we have because your brain's not making dopamine. So the reason why we have to give you L-dopa or levodopa, not dopamine, is that dopamine uh, gets degraded in the gut and never gets into the brain. So we have to give you L-dopa or levodopa because that actually goes through the gut and is able to get into the brain. So if we just gave everybody dopamine, everyone would just be sick all the time, no, some, no improvement. So levodopa is what we give people. Um, and in the beginning, we didn't have carbidopa. So when you're taking carbidopa, levodopa, it's actually two separate compounds. And carbidopa is the, re the reason why we give levodopa with carbidopa is because carbidopa reduces the, um, the change between L-dopa to dopamine in the gut. And like I said, dopamine causes you to get sick. So before, when this was just developing, we just had to give people levodopa and then throw up for an hour and then they'd feel better. So carbidopa was developed to reduce that symptom. The effect is short-lived. So we have not figured out a great way to fix this. So that's why even in the beginning of the disease, you gotta take the medication three times a day. And then dyskinesias develop in most patients. So that's what Michael J. Fox has. He has very severe dyskinesia where he has these uncontrollable movements. Um, but most patients actually feel better when they have dyskinesias as opposed to not, because when you have dyskinesia, it means the medication's working. So it's oftentimes more bothersome to the family members or to friends because they see you having these weird movements and they don't know what's going on. But to you, you're able to control your movements. When you have dyskinesia, you can walk, you can do what you want to do, and then the medication wears off and you feel worse. So dyskinesias are not always a bad thing, uh, but everyone's always very afraid of dyskinesia, Okay. So this medication has been around for 50 years and this is still what we use, right? Um, so Oliver Sacks wrote about this uh, revolution in Parkinson's disease treatment in his book, Awakenings. Um, I don't know if many of you have seen the movie with Robin Williams. Those patients did not have Parkinson's disease. Those patients had um, uh, encephalopathy caused by the, the last pandemic. <laughs> the last pandemic, we had a lot of these patients who, who had the Spanish influenza actually developed this very severe Parkinsonism. So if you can imagine these older patients had to wait until the seventies to get treatment for this. So, um, but it was pretty remarkable. That's why this book was made and the movie was made. So like we talked about before, with normal aging, even you get a slight decrease in dopamine cells. This is just normal. But in Parkinson's disease, we, we talked about, there's some trigger that happens probably 20 years before that starts in the gut, spreads into the brain, and then your dopamine production is going down and down and down through the progression of the disease course. So what do we do? We add levodopa, right? So we add levodopa to try to bridge this gap between the dopamine that you're not making and the dopamine that you should be making. Okay. So as the progression goes on, you can see, right, this little pill where it was working in the beginning as the disease progresses, that's not enough. So what do we do? We add more levodopa and we keep doing that as the disease progresses, right? Until you can't tolerate it, you have side effects of the disease, but that's typically what we'll do. Or we'll add a modifying drug like Intacapone, uh, Comtan, um, Opicapone, one of the MAOB inhibitors like Rosagiline or Selegiline, or even a dopamine agonist. Some of these medications can extend the time that levodopa works, bump up the dose a little bit in the brain. So you don't have to take more levodopa, but you're taking an extra pill to extend that on time. Okay, any questions? All right, so this is what happens. And this is why we have to give levodopa multiple times a day is because your concentration of levodopa is just going up and down, up and down, up and down all day long. So in the beginning of the disease, you don't really notice this change, right? You take your pill at six, noon six, medication stays in your system. You don't really have off time or side effects. But then as the disease progresses, what happens is that you start to get on and off time. So on time, most people experience when they start taking the medication. And then off time is what we have as the disease progresses and um, too high or dyskinesias or the side effects that we have when patients. Um, what, what we think happens is that as the dopamine cells die 
in the brain, you can no longer store the levodopa that we're giving you. So the medication acts in shorter and shorter windows and you start to get side effects because the dopamine's not able to be stored and processed appropriately in the brain. So you start to get these side effects. Okay, so the change with levodopa is mostly driven by the progression of the disease, okay? So it used to be thought that levodopa at the beginning of the disease actually drove some of these side effects, that patients who were started on levodopa early would get dyskinesias earlier, would start to have hallucinations earlier. This is not true. We know this is not true anymore. Patients who start levodopa earlier in the disease process actually have better quality of life earlier on as opposed to us waiting, 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 waiting until you just can't take it anymore. And then we give you levodopa and you feel better, but you're already down here where you may need more of the medication. So we try to give you low doses in the beginning to give you the best quality of life that you can. And then when you need it, we increase the dose. So all of this stuff about can't take levodopa, won't work after a certain period of time, give yourself the levodopa, right? Give yourself that quality of life in the beginning of the disease because everyone's gonna have problems and it doesn't matter when you start taking levodopa. So this is just another graph demonstrating in the beginning of the disease, we call it the honeymoon phase because you can't tell when the medication's kicking on, you can't tell when it's kicking off, you feel great, right? But then as the disease progresses, this is typically what happens is that patients feel off in between the doses. So medication that you take it, feel great, may wake up feeling real bad. You take the medication, it kicks in after about 30 minutes, you have a good morning. And then by lunchtime before the medication is due, you start to feel the symptoms coming back again. And this happens before every single dose. So what do we do? We increase your medication levels, right? So then you never really drop into this off period. I mean, just have like a very brief off period, but that's really what we're trying to do when we increase the medications, keep you in this sweet spot right here. So what happens when we get dyskinesia? So that means that lower doses cause side effects and that's because of changes in the brain. That's not because of the levodopa, that's just your brain is changing. So you may get dyskinesias in between. So before this dose was great, you were on, you were off. Now you're not really staying on and are you're on, but you're getting dyskinesias in between the doses. And that's not always a bad thing like we talked about because it means that the medication's working. If it's mild dyskinesias that aren't bothering you, then we don't have to do anything about it. We'll just keep you at that dose. But if the dyskinesias are really affecting you, you know, they're getting in the way of you doing things like being able to put on clothes because your arms are moving too much, uh, then we treat those. So what do we do? Then we have to increase the time that you're taking the medications to keep you on, but also lower the dose to keep you from not having dyskinesias. So this is what we're always thinking about when you come into clinic and why it's always important to talk to your doctor and know when is the medication working? When is it wearing off? So this is something we'll talk about at the end of the discussion, um, why it was really important about a week before you come into the doctor's office to write down your symptoms. Is my medication working consistently throughout the day? Is there a time of the day that I always feel off? Is there a time of the day that I'm wiggling more? knowing this is really important for us to be able to treat you appropriately. So we can get you to be back in this sweet spot right here. Okay, so levodopa, like we talked about, powerful treatment for Parkinson's disease. Delaying levodopa does not prevent these fluctuations from happening. That is just a product of the disease. So if you are scared because you've seen something online, that is old information. Um, and then delaying levodopa does not prevent dyskinesias. So if you're gonna have dyskinesias, you're gonna have dyskinesias, but we have ways to treat those. So don't be afraid of this because of something like I said that you've read online. Um, delaying levodopa often leads to under treatment, poor quality of life, and then using excessive levodopa earlier in the disease process will cause earlier dyskinesias. So we used to treat patients with Parkinson's disease early in the disease process with high doses of levodopa to get patients to look perfect, right? So that you didn't look like you had Parkinson's disease. We don't do that anymore. We treat with low doses so that you can do what you need to do, have good quality of life, but you're not having significant risk of having side effects early in the disease process. So our thinking has really changed a lot, even in just the past 10 years of how we treat the disease. And then balance is essential. 
So when you come into clinic, that's why we're always asking about falls, near falls, because these are the things that will cause high morbidity and mortality in patients. So you hurt yourself, you end up in the hospital, that's gonna shorten your lifespan. So there are a lot of different medications these days other than levodopa. We have these things called MAOB inhibitors. These keep your dopamine around a little bit longer. So that's like selegiline, risagiline, and safinamide. Um, so it just blocks this enzyme in the brain that breaks down the dopamine. So when we give you the dopamine back, your brain doesn't have the chance to degrade it. And so it just stays around a little bit longer. Um, amantadine, this is a really old flu medication that we use now. Um, it increases dopamine, but we also use it to treat dyskinesias when you develop dyskinesias. Um, and it, it can be very effective. Uh, dopamine agonists, um, this medication mimics dopamine. It looks like dopamine to the brain by stimulating those dopamine receptors. Um, these are, there's a few of them now, primipexol, ropinerol, roticotine, apomorphine. Um, these have a lot of side effects. We used to start with these medications because they were levodopa sparing, but they have a ton of side effects. So they're falling, they're kind of falling out of um, uh, favor because they just have so many side effects. We may use them in, in along with levodopa to try to help the levodopa work better. Um, and that's typically what people are moving towards is using them as an adjunct of therapy to levodopa as opposed to starting therapy. And then there, there's this new drug, um, estradefiline, which is an adenosine two, A2A antagonist. Um, I haven't used it that much because it's very new. I haven't had a lot of uh, patients who've had benefit with it, but um, it's a newer drug. Um, and then COMT inhibitors, which are really very good. Um, these are drugs like entacapone and opicapone. And this also works similarly to increase the amount of levodopa that's in your system. So as you progress in your Parkinson's disease, you may take more than levodopa, you may take more of these medications. The agonists are the most common to cause those. Um, yeah, so when we give these, we always have to educate patients that, you know, what an, ice, what an impulse control disorder looks like, and that if you develop these things like shopping, eating, hypersexuality, we've got to come off of these medications, okay? Um, but also levodopa can cause this too, but it's much, much less, um, less often than with agonists. Yes? You said freezing? So when you freeze, you have anxiety because you're freezing, but anti-anxiety medications have not been shown to help freezing. Yeah, not a whole lot helps with freezing of gait. Unfortunately, if it's not responsive to levodopa, freezing gait is one of those symptoms that we're really, really, you know, working on trying to find a treatment for, but nothing really has been helpful so far. No, because then you fall more frequently. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot of forms of levodopa. We won't go through this, but um, the ones that are newer is this embresia, this inhaled levodopa. Um, and duopa is not new, but it's been around a long time and it's a different way of um, getting uh, dopamine into your system. So it's, it's uh, infused through a tube in your stomach. Um, so a little bit invasive. Uh, there's going to be a new mechanism. I think that's going to come out probably in the next few years, which is an uh, subcutaneous drug like insulin. So they, there's a needle that goes under your skin and the levodopa is infused throughout the day. So those trials are just wrapping up now and they're looking pretty promising. So that might be another option for patients as, as opposed to some of these medications. Uh, Ritari is also pretty new. It's a mix of an immediate release and a controlled release and it comes in a capsule form. So when you start having those wearing off symptoms, um, Ritari can sometimes be effective and the right patient uh, there is this controlled release cinemat that was developed a long time ago, but it's, it's not as effective. It's not predictable. We can't tell when you're going to turn on or when you're going to turn off. Everybody's different. So we don't like to use it because it's hard to titrate in specific patients. So we don't use it that often unless we use it at night to kind of help keep you with a little dopamine in your system, but we don't use CR typically during the day. Okay, so exercise is extremely important in Parkinson's disease. Okay, this is almost, almost as important as medication because we think that exercise actually can 
slow down the progression of Parkinson's disease. And what type of exercise? Probably high intensity aerobic exercise. So getting your heart rate up to 80% max is better. So that gym that's called Orange Theory, that's, that's what that is, is where your, your heart rate gets into this orange range that's kind of almost to your maximal heart rate. You gotta keep it there for about 20 minutes, five times a week. And then that's basically all that, we, all that you gotta do to maintain this. So pick something you like, right? The best exercise is something you will do. If you hate it, you're not gonna do it. So try to pick something that you enjoy. Um, so we also uh, do lots of therapy. So um, LSVT Big is a specific program developed for Parkinson's patients. Um, LSVT Loud is a speech therapy. So if you're having problems with speech or speech is too soft, people can't understand you, this is a great resource. Um, you know, there's been evidence that Tai Chi can help, tango classes, uh, karate classes, sometimes massage and acupuncture in the right patient can be very helpful for things like pain. And then maintaining your social engagements. So this is difficult, obviously, with the pandemic that's been going on to maintain social engagements. Hopefully those will start to come back as the maybe the pandemic slows down. We'll hope that it stays down this time. Um, but staying socially active is really important. So people tend to isolate themselves with Parkinson's. They're embarrassed about their symptoms if they have to use a cane or a walker. But social engagement is actually really important for cognition, right? Because you're engaging those parts of your brain where you're thinking, you're having conversations. So that's really important to maintain. And then cognitive activities. Some of these puzzles have not been shown to be that helpful, but things like staying engaged, reading, um, doing things that you like to do as much as you can, that's really important. Okay, and then health maintenance is also really important, right? So just because you have Parkinson's disease does not mean that you can't get other diseases as well. So like we talked about, most people will not die from Parkinson's disease, they'll die from something else. So you want to make sure that you're on top of all of the other things too. If you have Parkinson's disease, but you have uncontrolled diabetes, that's going to be really bad for your balance because you're going to get things like retinal damage and nerve damage. So we've got to also control these other symptoms. Similarly, like if you have a heart attack and you have Parkinson's disease, we want to try to prevent these things from happening. Um, getting your vaccines is really important. Flu vaccines, um, the COVID vaccines, and then skin exams are really important because Parkinson's patients are at a slightly increased risk of getting melanoma. So you want to make sure that you make your yearly dermatologist appointment to get that checked. And then treating mood problems, very important because like we talked about, social engagement is really important for Parkinson's disease. So if you're having problems with depression or anxiety, please talk to us and we can help you through that. And then treating joint problems. So orthopedic issues, right? If you're having knee problems, hip problems, shoulder problems that are just related to arthritis, we want to get those treated so that you can be active and you can exercise and then cancer and other illnesses. So getting your mammograms, getting your colonoscopies, all of those good things, also really important. Okay, so treatment, like we talked about, this is just a summary slide. So when you're having mild symptoms, I'll often tell patients just to increase their exercise. Then we do start medication. Some people will still start levodopa bearing medications. Carbidopa levodopa is the standard of treatment, okay? And then non-motor symptoms, um, all of these things. There are a lot of treatments for these, so please let us know what's going on with you, okay? If you don't tell us, then we can't help you. And then treatment is a partnership between the patient and the provider, right? I always think of patients not as medication. I think medicine's changed a little bit over the years where it used to be kind of a dictatorial thing, like I tell you what to do and you have to do it. But now this disease is a long disease, right? We're going to be working together for decades. So I want you to feel like you can, we can have a conversation about your medical treatment. If something isn't working, you don't like the way it makes you feel, please tell us because like we went through, there's a lot of different treatments for this disease. So if you're not enjoying your life, if you don't feel like you're getting good quality of life, please let us know. We can try to help you as best we can. Um, so everything is personalized. And like I said, that's why I have a job because if I didn't, if this was like a cookbook disease, you know, there wouldn't be movement disorder specialists. And then exercise, 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 right? Do the best that you can to get aerobic exercise. Even if this is just, if you're not able to exercise a lot, take a walk, you know, this is a really nice part of the country. I used to live in Chicago, could never tell people to get in the pool. Right? So now people get in the pool for six months, walk in the pool a little bit. Um, all of these things are really helpful. So um, do as much exercise as you can do. 
Okay, so this is the last part, just a couple slides on making the most of your clinic visit. So when, when you come in, this is what I'm gonna ask about. How's your Parkinson's disease? Any safety concerns? That's why we always ask about falls. And then do you have any new problems? Do we need to change your medications? And then these are typically your priorities, right? You wanna feel better. You wanna know whether a new symptom has popped up, if that's Parkinson's disease or not. How is the disease progression progressing? And then any questions that you have Honestly, this is mostly from kids. My kid wanted me to ask you if this was, you know, supplement is gonna be helpful. All of these questions are great to ask. Um, so this is what we do in the visit. We talk about your symptoms, we do the physical exam, and then we end it by discussing medical advice and medication changes. So what do you need to do? So one week before the visit, make a list of anything you wanna talk about as it comes up. Because we all know that once you get in the doctor's office, you forget half of things that you wanted to say. So write down all of your medications as well. So we know exactly what you're taking. This includes non-Parkinson's medications, because like we talked about before, there are a lot of medications that can worsen your symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So we want to know every single thing that you're taking. If you can't write them down, then just bring them in. And then we'll go through your medications. And then think about your goals. What would you like to be doing more of? What are some things that you haven't been doing that you'd like to start doing? because sometimes we can actually help with those things. So if you don't ask, then we won't be able to know. And then what's keeping you from doing those things that you like, okay? And so bring that list in with you. So this is also really important as the disease starts to progress. So consider making a diary if your medications aren't working appropriately. So write down, so I took my medication at six, started working at 6.30. Seven o'clock to nine o'clock, I felt great but my do next dose isn't due until 12 and then between 10 and 12, I feel awful. This is really important for us to know. So making those types of lists, notations to yourself so that we can know exactly what time your medications start working, when they stop working. Sometimes even knowing when you eat can be really important because that can affect um, how good the medication is working. Um, and so if you're not feeling like you're getting the most out of your medication, sometimes it can be really helpful to write down times when it starts working when it starts wearing off and that way we can get a really great idea of what exactly is going on and how we can adjust your medications so like we talked about bring your medication list ask as many questions as you want try to make a list so that you remember what you wanted to talk about and then teach back so if you're having problems understanding what your doctor's saying to you repeat the plan back okay and that way we can understand if you understood what we were telling you to do I try to write down medication changes, but sometimes you know, those printed out lists can be lost. You don't know where you put it after you get home from the doctor. So please ask us um, to explain anything again that you did not understand. And then after the visit, monitor any medication changes that we made. Is there a benefit? Ask your family to monitor you. So if you can't always tell when you're having dyskinesia, ask your family to look at you and see when you're having dyskinesia. Do they feel like you're more confused when you're taking the medication? Are you having to take naps more often? And then does it depend on the time of day? This one is really important for us to know. What time of day do you feel bad? And that way we can adjust your medications appropriately. Any side effects, um, any problems with the schedule? Are you having problems remembering your medications? Um, this is a big issue and we can definitely help you with some tricks that we've learned over the years to help patients remember how to take them. And then write it down because you're gonna be, you're not gonna be seen probably for a couple of months. So write everything down. Um, if it's obviously an emergency, please come back and call us and let us know. Or if you're really uncomfortable or your quality of life is bad, please let us know. I've had patients go months between appointments after we've changed their medications, they felt horrible. And then they don't tell me until three months later. So we're here for you. Please let us know if you're having issues. All right, any questions? Yes. Uh huh. Yes. So there has been some. This is a question about anesthesia and Parkinson's disease. So surgeries themselves can make Parkinson's worse. Any stress on the body will make your Parkinson's disease worse, but it's only acutely in the recovery period. Once you recover, things get better. So it's the same thing with getting sick. Um, uh, if you're ill, you're gonna have, your symptoms are gonna be worse. But as you recover from the surgery, things should get better. 
Now, there has been some evidence with cognitive decline after general anesthesia. So if there is a way that the surgeon can do local anesthesia with maybe a sedating medication, I would encourage everybody to ask their doctor about that. Now, some, some surgeries cannot be done without general anesthesia, but knee replacements can sometimes be done with local and a sedative. So things like that, you should definitely ask if that's an option for you. It may not be, but it's good to ask. Okay, and you had a question? There's a little confusion at the level when I got into the report two minutes later. Sure. Who you are most Okay. Uh, my name is Megan Bailey, Dr. Megan Bailey, and I'm the newest member of the movement disorders group. So I'm a Parkinson's disease, primarily Parkinson's disease doctor. I do see other patients with move, other types of movement disorders, but probably 80% of my patients are Parkinson's so disease. The yeah, we work across the hall from each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Michelle Stoff, she's in the back. She's the nurse practitioner that works with us. So we're, we're a team. We're trying to become more um, uh, more coordinated so that it's not just one person, but if you have emergencies, then we can switch around and see you because, you know, there's a lot of patients with Parkinson's disease and we're trying to give you the best possible care that we can. So if we can help each other out by seeing our, each other's patients in a pinch, we'll do that definitely. So you don't have to wait six months to be seen. Mm -hmm. So, Yes. Um, Tell me if I'm on track. If I take cinnamon, I, sh I should wait maybe a half an hour before I eat, mm -hmm. especially, especially if, there's, if it's protein rich. Yes. If I, if I eat a protein rich meal two hours. Yes. Um, so it really depends on specific patients. And in the beginning of the disease, food doesn't really change the medication effectiveness. So in the beginning, we don't really matter. It doesn't really matter that much. As the disease progresses, any small change in levodopa is going to affect how you feel. So how on you feel with that dose. So that's when we try to tell you to separate it out from food. And so protein heavy meals are definitely going to cause that dose of levodopa to not work as well. So if you want to separate it out even further from the medication to see if that works, but what we often tell patients, is just wait until dinner to have your heavy protein meal. So if you're going to have a steak or something like that, try to have it at the end of the day, because then it won't affect you as much through the whole day, but it really is person to person dependent. And it's not a blanket statement that we tell everyone, like don't eat protein until the dinner time. It's really, if you notice that your medication doesn't work when you eat protein, then we move your medications. We move your protein to the end of the day. So with regard to exercise, my understanding is take protein after your exercise. Mm -hmm. so, even though I'm not far away, I'm going to go up. I mean, that's not as hard and fast of a rule, the exercise. I mean, you want to make sure you're maintaining your protein intake so you're not losing muscle mass. Um, but when you take it, it shouldn't really matter that much. Yeah. And I think you had a question. Uh huh. Or just fatty content. Okay. So that's a complicated um, thing that can happen either just alone because of the Parkinson's disease or because of the medications that you're taking. So we definitely have treatments for that. So if you're having significant problems with standing up and, you know, having passing out episodes or feeling faint, there's lifestyle changes that we can recommend, and there are also medications. You're on fluticortisone. Yeah, that's a good medication. Yeah, you have to make sure when you do take fluticortisone, you take it with a little salt because it actually keeps salt in the bloodstream. So that makes it work a little bit better. So if you're limiting salt for whatever reason, yeah, that's great. Then you're doing exactly what you need to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I think it's a discussion between you and your doctor. And I will start medication if patients are having problems even with their hobbies, right? If you like to needle point and you can't do it anymore, and that was a big source of joy in your life, then we'll start medication, right? But when, we, when I definitely recommend starting medication is if your balance is affected. So if you are having near falls, we have to put you on medication because that's kind of the, the worst thing that can happen to Parkinson's patient is a fall and an injury. But otherwise, it's really just a discussion. So 
if your work is being affected, if your personal life is being affected, we'll start medications. But the bottom line, when you're having problems with balance, we have to start medicine. Yeah. And another question. As far as diet, are there certain foods or certain diets that are better for you to, you know, adhere to and that sort of thing? I mean, we always talk about a modified Mediterranean diet, uh, just because it's good for your heart and anything that's good for your cardiovascular system is good for the brain, but it's not necessarily Parkinson's disease related. It's just, you know, we want to keep your blood flow good in your brain. Cause if you have strokes or what we call microvascular disease because of poor blood flow in the brain, that's going to cause you to have worsening Parkinson's symptoms because of other things like strokes, you know, obviously. So we want to make sure your heart healthy too. <laughs> sure. If you have low blood pressure, how does that affect you going on like the uh, medication? So we monitor it very closely. Um, if you've always had low blood pressure, you're just a person with low blood pressure, then um, then we just we just monitor. We tell you that we got to watch out for it. If your blood pressure drops with the medication, then we'll we'll have to adjust it. Um, but otherwise, you know, we just we'll start the medication otherwise. Yeah. And if you're on anti like a blood pressure medicine, we'll often work with your primary care doctor or your cardiologist to get you off that medication so that we can then put you on higher doses of the levodopa. Who's first? You were first. Multivitamin. Yeah. Nothing in particular. Yeah. Some people take like turmeric or cinnamon, things like that, but um, really, you can get antioxidants in your diet. Um, so really colorful vegetables and fruits like blueberries, blackberries, kale, like really colorful things. Those have good antioxidants in them. So you don't have to spend money on supplements. You can just eat a couple of blueberries. Okay. And then I think you had. So um, there's a disease called vascular Parkinsonism that is not Parkinson's disease, but it's caused by like many strokes in the brain or damage from poor blood flow in the brain. And it looks different from Parkinson's disease or looks, it can look similar, but it doesn't respond to levodopa because it's not from that dopamine breakdown, right? It's because the brain is damaged itself from those small blood vessels being broken and not feeding the brain with blood. So that's a completely different thing. Yeah, and then I think there was. Not unless you're having other symptoms besides your Parkinson's. So if you come in and you're like weak or you're having um, a lot of like tingling numbness pain that's shooting down your leg or something like that, then we may, we may evaluate you for that on a separate basis. But as far as getting imaging for Parkinson's disease in general, we can't see Parkinson's disease on an MRI. So there's really no point in getting repeat MRIs. It's just going to be inconvenient. Yes, much more important. We typically tell people once a year. Um, and then the psychologist sometimes will recommend if the tests are normal, then you won't have to come back until you start to see changes or your family starts to see changes. Um, but uh, it's difficult here. We don't have as many neuropsychologists as we need most likely. So the wait time is very long for these appointments. Um, but if I had my preference, everyone who was diagnosed with Parkinson's would get a first time evaluation. So we get a baseline and then we would repeat it over time as your symptoms start to change, but it's hard to do that here. So how in your time really life, what kind of testing? That is actually a biopsy of the brain. So, yeah. Yeah, so we don't, we don't wanna do that. Yeah, that's not something that we will do. And I think there was someone in the back here and then I'll get to you. Uh-huh. Can you address fatigue? Mm-hmm. Yes, fatigue is an extremely common and very hard to treat symptom of Parkinson's disease. So what I tell my patients is drink a little coffee. Um, that's actually better than any of the other medications like modafinil or even like stimulants like Ritalin. Those are not even very effective in Parkinson's disease. They've actually done studies looking at fatigue with these prescription medications. Coffee is just as effective. So have a coffee, take a nap. Don't feel guilty if you need a nap. It's basically 
all that there is to it, but it's, it can be really awful. And then exercise also is really important to improve fatigue. It doesn't sound like it would be, but if you improve your physical stamina, your fatigue will actually improve over time. And then, yep, uh-huh. Um, one of my TV peers is uh, about my age, close to 60, and he already had PBS, and he's encouraging me to do the same. Uh-huh. So I don't feel like I need it. <laughs> fine. Yeah. But um, I do kind of wonder, at what age do you time out from it? I, I think that what I understand is if your cognition is going south, you're not a good candidate. So mm -hmm. you want to get PBS before that. And it's not like Parkinson's is going to cure itself. I mean, it's going to continue to degrade or progress. Mm -hmm. So it seems like everyone sort of needs to plan in advance if they think that they might be a, a reasonable candidate for BBS to get it done by like age 70. So 75 is typically the age that we will then have to look at each individual patient specifically and say, if your cognition is fine and you're 75 plus, then we'll still do DBS. Or we'll do one side only of the brain so that you don't get both sides because that's an increased risk. But 75 is typically where we kind of cut off and say, now we've got to do a little extra investigation, make sure we don't make you worse. But I can tell you from my perspective and also Dr. P's perspective, we're always looking at patients to see if they might need deep brain stimulation. So I will be open and honest with patients in the beginning of their disease pro you know, process you probably will need DBS at some point. We don't have to talk about it now, but you'll probably need it at some point and we can talk about it when I think it's appropriate. So if your doctor doesn't feel like it's appropriate, at least with us, you know, we're trained movement disorders doctors and we know when you're gonna be a good candidate. And if you're not a good candidate, you can always ask about it, but we'll tell you, honestly, you don't need it yet. It's, you know, it's a brain surgery. So we try to not do it until, it's necessary or we think it will be more beneficial to you than just medications. Yeah. Uh-huh. How often do you recommend In the office? So I would say every four to six months is probably good enough. Um, if it's in, if you're having more problems, then you might need to be seen more frequently. But if you're stable and you're, nothing's really changing that much or there's still a slow decline, four to six months is probably good enough. Uh -huh. How about vitamin B6? Vitamin B6, um, it's really popular right now, but if you take too much, it can also it can actually cause nerve damage. So, you know, so we don't want you to take too much B6. So that's why I tell patients multivitamin is great, probably vitamin D, um, extra vitamin D because everyone's vitamin D deficient. Um, but other than that, um, unless you have a deficiency that's documented, like your B12 is low or, you know, you're having some other issues that your doctors noticed, multivitamin is fine. Okay. I think we're getting close to the breakout time. Um, yeah. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about this. Unless anybody, any other questions before we end? <laughs> It will be. We're recording it, so it'll be available online. So much Great. I'm glad that you found this helpful. Yeah. So this is something we're going to do every month, different topics. Um, so everybody's going to get, you know, we'll have lots of different things that you can learn about. So this was the kind of what we're trying to do is get you some education outside of the clinic. So I'm Brian. I'm uh, the director of the medical group with Novant Health. Uh, first of all, I just want to give Dr. Bailey a round of applause. Thank you. Formative and educational. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have breakout sessions after this. So this is an education and support group. So we're going to um, have patients in one area and caregivers in another. Everybody's comfortable with that. So we're going to do that in a second. There's coffee and water outside. Second thing I wanted to say, I heard a lot of great questions around nutrition, sleep, um, cognitive, the brain stimulation. So in the future, we'll have a new topic and presentation every single month. And then all of these will be recorded. So patients with new diagnoses will be able to hear your questions and learn from those in the future. So I just wanted to thank everybody for your engagement and, and being here today. And we're excited to continue to, to develop this and grow this to help people move forward.
Yes, ma'am. This is a little technical, technological question, but can the screen that's showing Dr. Bailey and saying recording, can that be minimized? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so sure you can see everything, yeah. yeah. <laughs> can that be no, uh, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yes, it can. And thank you. Yes. Uh, any other feedback? We would like to have it since this is our first session. I imagine it will continue to grow as we reach more of our patients. So please, I'm here, Dr. Bailey, Dr. Pete, just let us know anything we can do to make this a better experience for you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this doesn't have to do with um, what we're discussing precisely, but it's Parkinson's month. Yes. And I have postcards that people can send to President Biden. Uh, bringing awareness and um, asking for increased research. You write a personal note on back, it's addressed, just got to put a stamp on it. And these will just be on the table if anybody wants to do it. Sorry, I couldn't figure a good time to put that in. No, thank you. That's great. Now, I've got a PS in the public service in Memphis, too. Yeah. Um, we have a list of about 250 people in the area with Parkinson's and or their support persons, if you want to be on the roster and receive a monthly newsletter for meetings, we mentioned this one in our in our newsletter, but if there's something else going on in town related to PD activities, social events, rock study boxing, things like that, uh, let me know, and I'll put it on the list. That's I'll be right great. there.